Our first panel today is on the key principles of the UN Charter in today's world. Um, any reinvigoration of the UN has to begin with the rule of law, human rights, and a recommitment to the principles of the UN Charter. And it's very appropriate of the Vienna Diplomatic Academy to have prioritized and given primacy to these principles. In their declaration on the commemoration of the UN's 75th anniversary, the heads of government, heads of state and heads of government unanimously affirmed that the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and international law remain timeless, universal, and an indispensable foundation for a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world. The UN Charter was adopted in the name of we the peoples in order to fulfill the promise of its preamble in accordance with its purposes and principles, including saving us from the scourge of war, maintaining international peace and security, strengthening universal peace, reaffirming faith and fundamental human rights and promoting equal rights of men and women, promoting self-determination of all peoples and the economic and social advancement of such peoples, to ensure justice and respect for international law, to ensure respect for equal sovereignty of states and territorial integrity of member states, and finally, to refrain from the use or threat of use of force other than in self-defense and as authorized by the Council. In light of these noble purposes and principles, if we were to take a report card of the UN today, the first quarter of this century, who were, and if we were to ask the Iraqi, Libyan, Syrian, Yemeni, and Ukrainian people about the scourge of war, if we were to ask the Darfuri and Rohingya people about the horrors of genocide and ethnic cleansing, the Afghan women and Yazidi women about the terror of the Taliban and ISIS, the Palestinian, Kashmiri, and Western Saharan people about the dehumanization of prolonged occupation, and the people of Tuvalu, Kiribati, and Marshall Islands about the nightmares of climate change. There are many failures, but we should not be blind to the few, albeit significant, successes, including the Security Council's referral of even heads of state to the International Criminal Court, upholding the principles of individual accountability, and that no one is above the law. The General Assembly's 11th Emergency Special Session condemning Russia's aggression in Ukraine, calling for its immediate withdrawal and upholding the prohibition on the acquisition of territory through the use of force, and the International Court of Justice receiving a record number of cases upholding the principle of peaceful and judicial settlement of disputes, double in the last 20 years than in the last 40, the prior 40 combined. Today's first panel is dedicated to the key principles of the UN Charter. We are honored to have a distinguished panel that will help us identify which principles are most at stake in today's world and which reforms are most likely to succeed in reinvigorating the UN. Ambassador Pascal Ferrara is the Director General for Political Affairs and Security in the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. He is also a Professor of Diplomacy and Negotiations and an expert on global religions and international relations. We're honored to have you here today, Ambassador. Sure. Ambassador Alexander Marshek is the permanent representative of Austria to the United Nations in New York. He's also a professor of international law and an expert on disarmament, <clears throat> arms control, and nonproliferation. He has played leading roles in the establishment of the International Criminal Court and in the NPT review conferences. Professor Joachim Müller is a former senior official of the OSCE as well as of the United Nations, having the distinct privilege of having served in all four of the main duty stations. He is the author and editor of Brill's multi-volume series on reforming the UN and co-editor of the annual review of UN Affairs issued by Oxford University Press. Without further ado, we will hear now from our distinguished speakers. I urge them to stay within the 10 minutes allotted to the opening remarks. Yeah so that we may have time for the interactive dialogue and the Q&A from our distinguished audience, both those here in person and those participating online. Our first speaker, Ambassador Ferrara, will tell us about Italy's vision for the UN in a changing world. Excellency, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear ambassadors, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm really honored to join this uh, timely and essential uh, debate. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, uh, the Vienna School of International Studies for this kind of uh, invitation. Um, humanity faces a stark and huge choice, a breakdown or a breakthrough. Uh, 
This was stated by the Secretary General of the United Nations in his report, Our Common Agenda. The United Nations is the only truly universal international organization. The Secretary General has made it clear that a business as usual approach is no longer an option since it would result in a breakdown of the global order. What's happening in Ukraine is outrageous. And since the beginning of the conflict, the United Nations has been invoked to help finding solution and in perspective reach a peace agreement. Now, you know that some critics say that the UN has not done enough. I have a different opinion on that. Uh, for sure, the Security Council was not able to reach consensus and fulfill its role of ensuring peace and security, pursuant to Chapter 7 of the Charter. But the Secretary General brokered with Turkey the successful Black Sea Grain Initiative that you know how important it is for food security. The General Assembly adopted with a large majority five resolutions on the Russian aggression against Ukraine, confirming its increasing importance. The Liechtenstein Veto Initiative, adopted last year, was another step towards a more responsible and engaged action by the United Nations. But the aggression perpetrated by Russia is perhaps the major challenge, in my opinion, to international security since the Korean War. It is an existential threat to the order we created in the aftermath of the Second World War with the United Nations Charter. Twice in our lifetime, the scourge of war has brought untold sorrow to mankind, reads the preamble of the Charter. And in the year when the United Nations was created, Italy was adopting its own constitution and uh, uh, embracing uh, a renewed democratic system. Now, it's very interesting that there is one uh, article in the uh, Italian constitution that says that Italy rejects war as an instrument of aggression against the freedom of other peoples as, as a means of settling international disputes. Italy consents on condition of equality with other states to the limitations of sovereignty that might be necessary to a world order assuring peace and justice among nations. And finally, Italy resolves to encourage international organization further such hands. These principles that sometimes can be considered expression of idealism in the current situation are actually a statement of realism because there is no real alternative as we can see every day in the international uh, scene. But uh, uh, we do not only believe in multilateralism, it's not enough. We invest on it. So seven, Italy, the seventh contributor to the regular and peacekeeping UN budget. But, and uh, this is very interesting, Italy is also the top Western contributor of blue helmets deployed on the ground. Italian military personnel are currently deployed in the UN peacekeeping mission in Lebanon, Mali, Cyprus, Kosovo, Western Sahara, and on the India-Pakistan uh, border. But I'm not here to, uh, here to advocate or to lobby in favor of, uh, of Italy. Everybody knows perfectly well what is our stance in the international scene. Uh, but there's one thing that uh, it's very dear to me, the engagement of uh, uh, my country in terms of defending human rights, but also in terms of uh, fighting against the death penalty. And I was proudly in the General Assembly uh, back in 2007 when the moratorium on the death penalty was approved by a tiny majority, but significant for the first time in the General uh, Assembly. Um, so is that the ideal situation for the United Nations? Is the United Nations really working? Uh, I don't think so. The Secretary General said in the um, uh, communication on our common agenda that we need to uh, embark in a process of effective uh, reform. Um, and uh, it, interestingly, uh, Secretary Guterres talks about inclusive and effective multilateralism. Why? Because today, if we look at the uh, international multilateral scene, 
we see rather a fragmented, even polarized, and even competing multilateralism. So just the, the, the contrary of what we mean when we talk about multilateralism, so working together for a common goal. But we are polarizing uh, ourselves within this broader uh, framework. And the UN Secretary General uh, also mentioned the reform of the uh, UN Security Council. This is a nuclear issue in the United, in the United Nations system. Um, of course, uh, why? Um, and I would like to make the case for uh, political science this, this time. So of course, it's about reform, it's about uh, 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 the, 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 the level of uh, representativeness of the membership of the UN Security Council, but this is important because the United Nations Security Council is the cornerstone of the collective security system. It was a huge breakthrough in human history for the first time we created this, uh, this body exactly to avoid what? To avoid self-help or just uh, resorting uh, by uh, unilateral means to solving the, the dispute. So this is important not because we are competing among us uh, in a sort of beauty context, who should be member of the UN Security Council, we should be permanent member, we should get the veto, and so on. The problem is, how we get this uh, body working for the benefit of collective uh, security. Um, since I'm not campaigning for, and uh, you are not voting for the reform of UN Security Council, I'm not going to elaborate on the details of the Italian reform of the, of the uh, proposal for the reform of the UN Security Council, uh, but I just would like to say that there are a few principles that uh, inspired our proposal. First of all, the principle of consensus. So if you create a, a by majority, a reform of the UN Security Council that divides the membership, uh, it's not a great uh, achievement after all. So uh, we risk to make the situation even worse than it is uh, today. Uh, second point, uh, no permanent uh, seat. Um, why? Because... Uh, in order to um, improve this situation, you can, we may think that enlarging the oligarchy is a solution, but enlarging an oligarchy is not a democratic progress. So we have to invent something different. And the third uh, merit uh, of the Italian proposal is there is a, a clear shift towards uh, regional representation rather than the focus of member states. Uh, of course, physical member states would be present, but with a broader presence of uh, uh, regional uh, organization that would express their um, uh, presence in the, uh, in the UN Security Council. And finally, uh, no veto for the new members. The veto is already today uh, contested, as you know. Uh, I mentioned the Liechtenstein veto initiative, but in the past it has, it has been also uh, contested when it is used in very tragic cases like genocide or uh, civil wars or other things that uh, have to do with uh, human security, I would say. I would also uh, um, try to uh, frame the role of the UN Security Council as a UN security uh, and the UN human security uh, uh, council sometimes, because human security is the also essential when we connect security with human rights, for instance. So the idea is that the veto should be uh, abandoned in, the, in terms of new uh, members because it uh, creates a, a, a condition of inequality among members that is unacceptable if we want a democratic reform. Democracy is not an opinion. Democracy means equality of condition, and it means also the uh, level of participation should be ensured to uh, everybody. So, uh, to, uh, to go to the, the final uh, uh, point, I think that uh, this is not a race for power. So we should abandon this kind of idea. Um, 
but we have to ponder and rethinking the organization governance and the working methods. In our internal system, we talk about checks and balances. When we uh, shift, for instance, from uh, a parliamentary to a presidential system, you need to compensate this with checks and balances. Any kind of reform of the uh, central body, the most important body of, UN of the uh, United Nations, which is the UN Security Council, should be accompanied by uh, a wide spectrum of reform in order to create a new balance in the, in the overall system. What about the, the agencies? What about all the uh, uh, subsidiary bodies of the, uh, of the uh, United Nations. So it's not as simple as that to say we enlarge, we restrict, we put uh, uh, the weight on the table or not. It's a broader endeavor and that's why I go back to my first point that is uh, very important to search for consensus because uh, otherwise any attempt to go towards a reform uh, by the force of numbers is destined to, uh, to fail. But I believe strongly in the centrality of the United Nations is the uh, most uh, precious uh, setting that we have in order to uh, bring about a more peaceful and cooperative world. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Ferrara. Um, we now turn to Ambassador Marshek, who will speak to us about nations united by law and compliance with the UN Charter. You have the floor, Excellency. Thank you very much, Mona, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Academy here for uh, advi uh, inviting me. It's great to see so many friends, and Mona, you made me into a professor of international law, which I am not, so, uh, but I am a great fan of international law, so that, uh, that I can uh, attend. When I told colleagues that I was coming here to Vienna, they asked me, why are you going to Vienna to talk about the UN? If you go to Austria, you should focus more on music and cakes and mountains. Uh, and well, honestly, I would love, love to devote myself entirely to mountains and cakes, so. but not today. Today is no mountain meeting. Today we talk about the UN, uh, and we should do that here in Vienna, because Vienna is one of the hosts of the UN, uh, and it is important that while we discuss this reform process, the big Our Common Agenda project that the Secretary General has launched in New York, we also need the input from Vienna. So I'm very happy that this is taking place here. I should probably also mention here at the outset that I am sharing with you my personal thoughts, and there should be no attribution to the Foreign Ministry. Our panel is called Upholding the Key Principles of the UN Charter in Today's World. And that sounds very straightforward, very clear. Unfortunately, though, nothing in today's world is particularly straightforward and clear. In fact, are we really sure in what world we really are in? At the moment, if you go through the UN in New York, you have the feeling we live in three parallel worlds. There is the Western world, which is dominated by the Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine, uh, focused on defending existing structures, existing principles, territorial integrity, non-use of force, and ensuring accountability for crimes. Then there's the Russian world, where Russia is leading the defense against uh, a West that seeks to destroy Russia and others that wants to expand NATO and impose awful, dreadful values uh, and fascist ideology on the world. And then there's the world of the global South, which is dominated by an existential struggle to overcome a whole multitude of challenges, hunger, poverty, disease, climate crisis, where the Russian-Ukraine war is a regional conflict that should be solved in Europe, and where there is a lot of frustration and unhappiness with the international system that's perceived as unfair, and where there is anger, anger with developed nations for double standards and other grievances. Now, since today's technology enables you to stay in your reality, the reality that you choose, that is a sustainable model of a world that you can decide to stay in for as long as you want. And that complicates international relations, especially at the UN. 
that especially at the UN, which currently faces a perfect storm of global challenges, a crisis of multilateralism, and fierce competition for scarce resources with other international organizations and fora. More than ever in the 78 years of the UN, it's grappling with fundamental, if not existential, challenges that are going to determine the UN's future. So for the next two days, we are going to sit here together to find out what the UN needs to do in order to be successful, more successful. And I will share with you my take, my take on what it needs, what we need to do. And I think what we have to really try, if we want to make the UN successful, we have to try our best to get everyone back into the same world, into the same UN, dealing with the same issues. We need states to trust each other. We need states to be able to rely on another. And for that, they need international law. The problem is international law is in peril. And here's my take on this. Most humans like predictability and order. Over the centuries, what we've built around us is a warm, comforting cushion of social codes, ethical codes, layers of religious and moral conduct that we want to enable to ensure us that we feel protected and comfortable. These were increasingly complex, and we've cushioned them also with repetitive procedures that give us the feeling that since we're doing the same thing, everything is as it should. From family rituals to global governments, we have created a system of repetitive comfort. Since founding of the UN, this quest for regulation has increased significantly, and we now have a regular machine churning out resolutions and conventions designed to regulate our life and relations of states. And this is good because it gives us comfort and it gives us stability. Whether it's trade or traffic or health or climate, there is no lack of primary norms. The problem is implementation, compliance. These past years, we've now witnessed an increasingly cavalier-like attitude towards international law. It's sometimes treated more like a set of recommendations that could be adhered to if we felt like it. The re uh, reliance on alternative realities, the possibility of fake news, decentralized enforcement in international law, all that makes it much easier to flaunt the systems and hope to get away with it. My concern is this, if international law risks losing its normative character, we are in jeopardy of losing a very, very useful instrument to regulate international relations, an, inter, an, a, an instrument that fosters stability, reliability and reassurance, and which is a cornerstone of peace. This is especially a problem for smaller states. They rely much more on the security system. And that was much of the reason why the smaller states are glad to join the UN, because it gives this promise of security and legality. And if that promise no longer holds, smaller states are going to have to look elsewhere for their security. And I think we see this uh, just recently in Europe, uh, if we see Finland and Sweden uh, orientating themselves and applying to NATO. Now, clearly, we all know here, at least many of us in this room know, that law is no recommendation. There is this accepted normative obligatory element in law to distinguish it from mere declarations of intent. While international law has always been less coercive or hard than national law due to the lack of central enforcement, the ILC's rules of state responsibility make clear that International law also contains normative elements. For treaties, this normative character is the very essence. That's why you make and conclude a treaty. You expect it to be binding. It's there in the principle of Pacta Sunt Servanda, Article 26, I think, of the Vienna the Convention of the Law of Treaties. It's clear that the idea of a treaty is that we fulfill it. And that, of course, also holds true for the Charter. And to make it absolutely crystal clear, the drafters of the Charter put it in there in Article 2, 
para 2. It says that member states not only need to fulfill the obligations of the Charter, they must fulfill these obligations in good faith. Practice, of course, has shown over the past decades, ever since the beginning of the UN, the Charter has been violated. Sometimes these violations are relatively small. We have infractions of Article 17, which is the obligation to pay your dues. We have had uh, violations of Article 100, which is the independence of the staff of the United Nations. But we have also had some violations of the core principles, uh, Article 2.4, the, uh, the, uh, the necessity not to use force, so the, the requirement not to use force. We saw that, for example, in 1990 in the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, or in 2003 when the US invaded Iraq, and recently, 2014 and uh, 2022, last year, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And of course, there are many, many more instances of, 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 of violations of Article 24 as well. The practice that all these violations occurred doesn't diminish the norm, as we know. Uh, there, no, none of the states is a persistent objector to the norm. None of these states have, no, there's been no tacit consent, there's been no subsequent practice to deviate from the rules. We saw a very clear reaction to the uh, Russian violation of Article 2.4 last year by over 140 member states uh, that, that agreed that this, was a, uh, that this was an illegal aggression. But such a very strong and also sustained reaction to a violation is the exception. The systemic UN reaction was, as uh, the ambassador just said, would be Security Council action to condemn the violation and to adopt measures. Due to the veto right, this role of the Security Council has fluctuated widely in the last uh, decades. Uh, and it has unfortunately turned out not to be the most reliable system. Today, we see a very blocked Security Council. Norm violations often do not lead to any reaction by the Council at all, and sometimes there is then the reaction by the General Assembly. There is very often reaction by individual member states that take regional action or individual action. But these are diverse, disorganized, and as we know from practice, they subside over time. In brief, there is no certain consequence for a violation of the Charter, and as a consequence of that, potential violators are not deterred from breaking the law. They feel that they can get away with it, and mostly they do. That undermines the trust in the system of law. Not overnight, we're not going to lose international law immediately, but gradually. Since international law, however, is such a prevalent instrument in all instruments, in all parts, in all areas of international relations, losing this hard obligatory tool would impact our international order profoundly. So, that's my take, if you wish. Uh, uphold the principles of the Charter, what we, and, and also thereby reinvigorating the UN, we need to strengthen the normative character of international law. Now that may uh, disappoint many of you. You may say, uh, what, that's, that's, that's it? Uh, shouldn't we focus on the core challenges of our time? Preventing war, fostering human rights, climate and security, mountains, isn't, isn't that, uh, is, aren't these, all these things much more relevant and important? And the answer is yes, all of those things are important and we have to address them all all these issues, everything, everywhere, all at once. We have to do that. But we need international law as a key tool in our toolbox. Hard, normative, obligatory norms are the reliable, indestructible cement of trust that binds states together that helps us rediscover the benefits of multilateral cooperation, the art of compromise, working together, that gives us the firm foundation to build a reinvigorated UN using the bricks of our common agenda, cementing that together. And international law helps us bring member states, all of us actually, together again into one single world as 
nations united by law. Thanks. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Our next speaker, Professor Joachim Muller, um, will speak to us about the potentials and the limits of UN reforms. That's right. Yeah. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Let me start by recalling that the UN has been the subject of many reform initiatives. Back in 97, Brill issued a publication describing 50 UN reforms. Francis Fukuyama, the international relations scholar, noted in Foreign Affairs the sheer size of the publication is testimony to the dysfunctional and perhaps ultimately unreformable character of the UN. This might be too pessimistic, but it leads me to my first observation, namely that the UN has expanded more than it has changed. A fundamental repositioning has not taken place. The basic structure of commissions, programs and funds was inherited from its early years. Even the expansion is less than often assumed. The UN budget has been rather stable for decades. To better understand the potential and limits of UN reform, it is helpful to distinguish between low politics and high politics. A large part of the work of the UN is routine business, including management, elaborating treaty obligations, maintaining peacekeeping missions, implementing development projects, and providing for refugees. Many of the activities involved, important as they are, can be described as low politics. They are typically under the radar of a senior decision maker, such as heads of state and government. Major problems such as the financial crisis of 2008, the global health crisis of COVID, or the war in Ukraine require the attention of senior decision makers. They are matters of high politics. Now, how did reform shape the UN? Let me highlight some of the main changes during the history of the organization and the associated SGs. Triquilly is the first SG managed to expand his function of chief administrative officer by also assuming a political role. This was done by giving life to Article 99 of the Charter, which allowed the SG to bring to the attention of the Security Council issues on matter of peace and security. Hammarskjöld has been credited with establishing the concept of peacekeeping, which was not foreseen by the UN Charter. The first missions were approved by the General Assembly despite opposition from France, the UK and the Soviet Union. This resulted in a financial crisis and prompted a first reform of peacekeeping. It was decided that peacekeeping missions would be established only by the Security Council, where the permanent members had a veto. Utan came into office when UN membership was enlarged with countries from the Global South. Focus shifted to development issues and technical cooperation. UNCTAD was established in 64, UNDP in 65. What came out was judged to be a non-system which lacked a central brain. It was proposed to channel funds for development through UNDP to specialized agencies. However, member states and the agencies themselves showed little interest in centralization. Other reforms included the introduction of country program planning and the resident coordinating, coordinator system. Waldheim took office when the UN became a political forum for policy discussion on development. The Global South, represented by the Group of 77, demanded a new international economic order. Emphasis was on national control over resources and self-reliance. The North resisted. Very little was agreed. This included the creation of posts of Director General for Development and Economic Cooperation, which, however, lacked decision-making power. Paris Equalia faced accusation of mismanagement and politicization by the US and donor countries, issues which have been with the UN ever since. When the US withheld its payment, the UN was close to financial collapse. Budget cuts and a new budget process succeeded in pacifying the US. It was agreed that budget approval was by consensus rather than one country, one vote. After this reform, no major budget increase was approved. Butrus Ghali came into office after the end of the Cold War. The UN was rediscovered with a massive increase in peacekeeping missions. The SG submitted the groundbreaking agenda for peace with a host of new proposals on preventive diplomacy, peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding. Regarding organizational matters, Butrus Ghali pursued a US agenda. This included closing the Center on Transnational Cooperation, consolidating departments in the economic and social area, <coughs> 
abolishing the post of Director General for Development and Economic Cooperation, despite being treasured by the G77, and establishing the Office of Internal Oversight, covering audit, inspection and investigation. Kofi Annan was a keen supporter of reform following the US lead. Major changes included establishing the post of Deputy Direct Secretary General, launching the Global Compact to reach out to business to adopt UN values, approving the Millennium Development Goals to combat poverty, hunger and disease by 2015, approving the concept of responsibility to protect civilians, establishing the Peace Building Commission, replacing the discredited Human Rights Commission with the Human Rights Council, and reducing US financial contributions. In return, the US repaid its massive arrears. Towards the end of Annan's term, corruption in the oil for food program and in procurement raised issues of integrity. The UN responded with an ethics office, procurement reform, whistleblower protection, and a fraud prevention policy. Ban Ki-moon completed several reforms which had been initiated prior to him taking office, such as establishing UN Women, launching Delivery as One, which focused on the coordination of agency at the country level, approving a zero tolerance policy on sexual exploitation, and completing the renovation of the UN building with a history of delays and cost increases. Finally, the 2015 UN Summit approved the Agenda for Sustainable Development to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all within 15 years. Building on the MDGs, the Agenda includes 17 Sustainable Development Goals and 169 targets, whereas the Agenda provides direction to governmental and non-governmental organizations. Its approval is not binding. In fact, implementation at the national level remains under the sovereign control of each member state. Such global goal setting results in weak international institutional arrangements and actual achievements are lagging. Guterres reshuffled the technical cooperation setup by moving control from UNDP to the SG office. Other changes included the restructuring of headquarter departments and the decentralization of management decision making. During his second term, Guterres launched our common agenda, which represents his vision for the next 25 years. He includes an exhausting list of approximately 90 goals for an inclusive, networked and effective multilateralism. Four meetings are included on Summit of the Future, on finance, on education and on social issues. Beyond merely setting global goals, the next step necessary will be to agree on concrete policy guidelines. Security Council reform has not been mentioned so far. Entirely in the hands of member states, it is one of the most fundamental reform issues. Launched 30 years ago, it is also the longest negotiation process in UN history. Several countries demand permanent membership with veto right. This requires a charter amendment with a two-third majority in the assembly, including the five permanent members. What can we learn from history? Essentially, reforms were implemented when addressing issues of low politics, such as management, technical cooperation, organizational restructuring. Often this required endorsement by member states, but was mainly left to the SG. When it comes to high politics, however, the success rate drops considerably. Here, the dominant concern are protecting the key principles of sovereign states, non-interference of internal affairs. Failure to address fundamental UN shortcomings has contributed to the organization being shut out of high politics. Specifically, there was little success in UN conflict resolution and mediation. As a substitute, the UN engages in humanitarian side of conflicts on development work and on coordinating global goal setting. To bring high politics back to the UN, fundamental institutional reforms are needed. This might require a revision of the key principles and the amendment of the UN Charter, charter a, a hurdle difficult to overcome. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mueller. Um, indeed, our speakers have highlighted both the, the ongoing Security Council reform. We need to remember in that context that the veto, which often paralyzes the UN and the Council in particular, is built in. It's, it's the way the UN is supposed to work. Um, and this was the way to get the permanent five, the powerful five at the time, to buy into the charter. So this was foreseen. It's not a surprise that we're handicapped when the P5 
become not what they were intended to be, the custodians of the charter, but rather the chief violators of the charter. And Ambassador uh, Mashek has reminded us that the US, UK, and, and Russia with their aggressions have, have illustrated that consequential impact, the erosion of international law that allows the custodians to become the violators, not to mention the very grave human rights records of China and uh, looking at the continuing existence of Guantanamo, the US as well. Um, not to mention, of course, Russia as a chief human rights violator, not only in this country, but beyond its borders. Um, so there's a lot of bad news, is, is what it comes down to. But there's also good news, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. The E10 have their own veto. They deprived the US at the time of an affirmative authorization for the use of force in Iraq, and that E10 veto can be used again to uphold international law, um, if exercised properly. The ongoing reform discussions have divided the rest of the international community, fighting for the crumbs of the P5 of power in the Security Council. The proposal put forth by Italy does have chance to reach consensus because it gives away the aspiration of, a, of yet more vetoes, yet more paralysis in the Security Council, and tries to rebuild the consensus around how do you make the Council more effective? How do you unite the collective will of the international community to actually fulfill the promise of the UN Charter? We have many allies in this struggle. Liechtenstein was mentioned, and we must pay tribute to Liechtenstein, in particular Ambassador Venevaser, who has led three of the most important advances in international law. The definition of aggression in the Rome Statute, when the Council failed to address the crimes in Syria and in, in Myanmar, it was the IIIM, the independent investigative body that is now investigating the crimes in Syria, and the Human Rights Council has paralleled that with a similar investigation in, for the Rohingya. Um, and last but not least, the recent standing mandate to allow the international community to hear and to hold accountable the permanent members when they use their veto reminding them that that is part of the Charter, but also part of the Charter is to act in accordance with the Charter, as Article 24 says. And last but not least, a reminder that the Secretariat has an independent role as a sixth principal organ with independence, impartiality, and hopefully integrity and leadership. Having said that, let us now focus on what is in each of your views, and we'll start with uh, Professor Miller the most important principle that you think will have the greatest added value to reforming the UN and reinvigorating the UN? Um, the most reform initiatives which relate to high politics needed to comply with key principles. I think the main two ones are, are known, they have been mentioned before. It's the sovereign states and non-interference in internal affairs. If the conflict if in conflict the reform proposes will not be approved. The Security Council reform is a case in point. Let me elaborate this further by recalling some other rejected reform proposals. This includes, for example, UN establishing a UN Development Authority, strengthening the authority of the General Assembly over the UN system, entrusting ECOSOC with the coordination of the financial institutions, including World Bank and IMF, establishing an economic security council, establishing a social council, establishing a semi-independent commission based on the model of the European community, establishing a ministerial council for global watch and human security, and establishing the position of deputy secretary general for sustainable development. The list goes on, but it shows and identifies what type of violation of the, of the principles can go along with those proposals. It's basically touching on the sovereignty of states and the non-interference issue. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Pascal, any yeah. thoughts? Um. Well, as I mentioned, this, this issue of the veto, it's quite uh, crucial, as you mentioned uh, before. the. It's a case when custodians become the, 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 the chief uh, violators of the, of the order that was established. So I think that one important point, even though we will not achieve uh, in the shorter term uh, any spectacular reform of the UN Security Council, at least to stress much more this issue of uh, accountability. Because 
the states that were chosen to be member of the UN Security Council uh, are there exactly because they have to fulfill a duty. They do not have to just follow their national interests, either strategic or political interests. They are there on behalf of the constituency. So the, the accountability towards the constituency through some new mechanism, uh, the Liechtenstein, but also the, the, the French Mexican initiative in case of uh, uh, genocide, for instance, where veto power cannot be uh, used. So we have to establish some, even if you maintain the status quo, the status quo from the point of view of the legitimacy, not the legality, but the legitimacy of UN Security Council cannot be uh, uh, continued like that. So we need to, to inject some mechanism in order to make the members of the UN Security Council really, really accountable on, uh, uh, in explaining what they are doing, why they are doing that, because they are there, because they are supposed to be the guarantor of the order, not the disruptor of the same order. And that's it for me. The accountability, it's uh, the key word. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Marshall. Well, you, thank, Mona, you asked about the, the, the principle, the most important principle. I think I made that clear in the first part of the state is the rule of law. For me, that would be the key uh, principle that we have to look at. But what reform could succeed? I think, well, Security Council reform is probably the one which should, uh, we should achieve a, a success because we've been working on it for such a very, very long time. So that should be easy to do. But seriously, I think if we look at the common agenda, we look at the common agenda, there are a lot of, a lot of reform processes uh, proposed. And in fact, we just this week at the UN agreed on, or not agreed, but we, we, we embarked on 16 parallel strands of reforms. And I mean, some of those, I think, are going to probably end up being su successful. Some of them may lead to something. There is the idea of transforming the trusteeship council. There is, since uh, Under Secretary General uh, Amandeep Gill is here, the uh, idea of a digital compact uh, and, and raising the relevance of digital tech. There is the idea of a new agenda for peace. Uh, and we also have in there a new vision for the rule of law. We don't exactly know yet what this means, but we can look and see a little bit what the organs of the, of the, of the UN uh, are, are doing. And we are currently looking at this, and, and, and I can just share with you a couple of thoughts. I mean, most of the attention is always directed for obvious reasons on the Security Council. And, um, We've heard many are calling for a reform. There's a lot of unhappiness here. Uh, we've had incremental success with various initiatives. The Liechtenstein initiative was mentioned, uh, which raises the political cost of the veto somehow. And I think that's a good uh, approach how to make it. It has to become increasingly politically costly to use the, the veto. Other initiatives, you mentioned the French-Mexican in initiative. I think, I mean, uh, as Mona said right at the, uh, the outside also, the Security Council is constructed the way it is for very clear, very tough and hard and realist political reasons. And I think we, we, we really love to criticize and, and, and there's a lot of scorn directed at the Council. We cannot necessarily accuse it of lacking vigor. Um, it's actually been fairly active, surprisingly active. And in, I looked, I checked up on some of the numbers. 2022 was the second busiest year of the Security Council. Um, it had 419 meetings and consultations on 49 agenda items. There were 445 outside experts invited under Rule 39, which means it was comparably open and accessible. Um, it adopted 54 resolutions, seven presidential statements, 67 press statements. Compare that to 1959. In 1959, the Security Council had five meetings and it adopted one Security Council resolution. Uh, we're saying we're in a new Cold War. 1959 was a Cold War where there was very little Security Council activity. Today, 
there is little effectivity, but there is still a lot of work being done. Unfortunately, it's more administration of international relations. Uh, it's discussing of issues rather than effectively enforcing the charter. Um, in view of the Security Council's unreliability, we also look at the General Assembly, and we have seen the General Assembly can also step up to the plate. We just saw last year, for the first time in, I think it was 40 years, the, how many? 20, the Uniting for Peace uh, resolution was, uh, was activated. So the GA does, does step up to the plate, but clearly the GA could possibly do more. It's the most legitimate body. Every state is represented. Every state has one vote. Um, the problem is the resolutions aren't binding, so it depends on member states to voluntarily implement anything that is adopted, and that's where we often have problems when the direction, the target of potential measures are very powerful states. Some advocate a stronger role for the Secretary General. I think the, the war in, against uh, Ukraine has shown that there are limits to what the Secretary General can do, especially if a violator of the Charter is one of the P5. But we heard at the outset also earlier today, uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative, the brokering of prisoner exchanges, other humanitarian agreements that are taking place, and also enabling the UN to be on the ground in Ukraine, helping doing humanitarian work with over a thousand uh, uh, staff. That is something that the Secretary General can do. There's also Article 99, which enables the Secretary General to bring to the attention of the Security Council any matter that he believes is, is important. Terribly underused. I don't, can't remember of a single instance where this was used. So that should something that definitely could, could be expanded on. Finally, of course, we also have uh, uh, international courts and tribunals that could become much more relevant. Uh, we have um, president of the ICC here. You know how much interest there is in courts. You know how much uh, workload you are getting. The problem with uh, courts and, uh, and, and, and tribunals, of course, is we have a lack of compulsory jurisdiction. There's a stagnation in Article 36 uh, of the ICJ statute declarations. We also have the problem of length of proceedings. If there is a violation of the charter, you need a quick reaction. You can't wait for a court to deliver a, a decision. And then there is the problem that decisions might not be implemented. And how do you enforce, again, the implementation of the decisions? So what else is there? And since uh, we're supposed to think outside the box, and Austria chairs, uh, and in New York, it chairs a group of friends of the rule of law, and we constantly encourage everyone to think outside the box. So we also thought outside the box, and I came up with an idea that, for, that is very much out of the box. <laughs> uh, it's the following. We all break norms sometimes, right? We, we speed, we go too fast, we park in a parking spot where we're not supposed to park. We do things we're not supposed to do when we think we might probably get away with it. Now, what works best in these instances? Automaticity of consequence. For speeding, it's the radar gun. If you see a radar gun sign, usually people drive slower because they know there will be a reaction to the violation of the norm immediately. You get their ticket. No matter how important you are, no matter who you know, you will get the ticket. Maybe afterwards you can wiggle yourself out of it, but you will immediately get a consequence. Now, such automaticity, of course, is more difficult in international law, but it does exist, and it exists even in the Charter. It exists in Article 19 of the Charter, where it says that if you fall behind in paying your UN dues, automatically you lose your right to vote. Now, why couldn't we think of systems whereby we use this system of automaticity also in reaction to more serious breaches of the Charter? Now, could we, for example, imagine the situation where the General Assembly decides ex ante, in ahead of time, that if there is a violation of the Charter, certain measures will automatically apply. The violator loses the right to vote, proceedings are initiated at a criminal court, financial assistance is withheld, flights are grounded because you're excluded from the YATA system, um, I don't know, uh, the internet, pff, you, have, you lose all access to the internet, something automatically issues which are automatically uh, 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 taken which 
are outside the necessity of member states to individually adopt. It's not a completely new system. In the uh, League of Nations, uh, there was also a uh, art, uh, Article 16, which said that if a member resorts to war, then uh, members automatically, immediately uh, subjected to the severance of relations. But that, of course, is a very different thing, because then uh, you had to do that yourself. Member states had to act again. In this, in my example, these reactions would be automatically implemented by civil servants from who, who only you know, deal with or are responsible to the organization they're implied in. But it shows that 100 years ago, when they were drafting the covenant of the League of Nations, they were also thinking of some sort of automaticity. And maybe today, 100 years later, we could also think of something that's a bit out of the box uh, and that uh, is a similar thing and which will get member states to think twice before they violate the Charter. That's actually the crux of the problem seems to be, as identified by all three of our speakers, is a question of accountability, of, of each organ fulfilling its role as envisioned in the Charter and the checks and balances of the Charter actually working to ensure that they do. The Council isn't a powerful body, it's a responsible party and needs to be reminded of its responsibility, needs to be held accountable for its failures to fulfill its responsibility. These measures that we're talking about here, whether it's the E10, whether it's the Uniting for Peace, or whether it's the automatic automaticity, which I hope you take forward with gusto, um, it, uh, are precisely ways to raise the cost of inaction, to raise the cost of failure, to raise the cost of misusing the powers in the Charter. The veto was given to protect your interest, not to protect your crimes, and that's what the response has to be to the, the Permanent Five, and, and Russia is not alone. It is the premier violator at the present moment in history, but it is not the only violator amongst the P5. And we will be more credible in gaining consensus if we remind the other P5 that they are not the best messengers having committed violations, with the possible exception of France most recently, which has advocated, as you rightly noted, Ambassador, the France-Mexico initiative on restraining the use of the veto. Um, and this does not require an amendment of the Charter. It's merely to remember that we're also parties to the Geneva Conventions. We're also parties to the Torture Convention. We're also parties to the definition of aggression and the prohibition in the Charter, a customary principle to refrain from using force to acquire territory and or to conduct our foreign affairs. So with that kind of framework of accountability, which is at the heart of rule of law, how do we ensure that all, including the Secretary General and the Secretariat for living up to their role as independent spokespeople for the people. The member states have their voices. The SG and the Secretariat have to be the voices for the we the peoples. And therefore, the SG has to do more than be the coordinator of the humanitarian affairs and the grain initiative. He has to put forward a peace plan. Mm. He has to require that war crimes be identified. Not just both parties have to respect IHL, but the party committing the overwhelming majority of IHL crimes has to be called by the Secretary General. And the peace plan can, of course, be a starting point for a discussion, for a convening of a table where both parties are called upon to come together to find an exit ramp from the horrors that are taking place today. So without further ado, we now turn to our distinguished audience, and we have audience both here in the room as well as online. I see one hand, I'll take two from the floor and one online to start. And please uh, 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 say whether your comment or your question is directed to the whole panel or to a specific member of the panel, and please keep yourself under one minute so that we can take more questions. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Eugene Chen. Uh, I am at uh, New York University. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, I actually have one quick reaction to Ambassador Marshik's uh, proposal and also a question for uh, Dr. Mueller. Um, I really like this uh, proposal with regard to automaticity. Um, that said, I think there's one practical challenge uh, in that type of a, an approach given that, uh, for example, with Article 19, determining whether member states are in violation of Article 19 and in arrears is fairly straightforward. Um, the question of who violates uh, principles of the Charter, though, is much more subjective. And so the question would be, who 
who would make that decision? And I think with Article 19, it's also, remember, it's also useful to remember that many countries, including the US, have found loopholes to be able to pay uh, very late. Uh, and for those countries that have regularly been in arrears for many decades, uh, for political reasons, the General Assembly has also, for decades, uh, continued to give them waivers to allow them to continue to vote, even though they have not met their charter obligations in that respect. Um, for, uh, for Dr. Mueller, I guess my question here is that, um, over, since the end of the Cold War, over the terms of the, success, the past uh, four secretaries general, um, the only um, major structural reforms of the bureaucracy have only taken place at the start of the secretary general's term, uh, which kind of suggests that the, our common agenda uh, initiative uh, might not actually lead to major reforms. Regardless of whether that's the case or not, what, uh, what types of structural reforms do you think are necessary and should be prioritized either as part of the uh, outcomes of the summit for the future or that the next Secretary General should prioritize at the start of her term? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gertrude Oelmark and my question is uh, to, Ms. to Ambassador Marshik. I find your suggestion that it should have an automatic consequence if, some, if, if a state violates the charter extremely intriguing. The thing is, uh, isn't it then necessary to empower the UN to dish out the consequences? For example, if you say a state should immediately lose access to the internet when <laughs> when he and the state violates the charter, uh, I'm not sure if the UN is even powerful enough to do this. So would it not also need to be necessary that you empower the UN to do this? Uh, the third question comes from our online audience. Um, the question comes from Nita Ramoko. And the question pertains to how do we best put in place mechanisms and strategies to improve the coordination and the coherence of the various parts of the UN, including the specialized agencies, in performing as one in order to enhance the effectiveness of the UN in reaching common goals on the ground, not just in terms of adopting resolutions, but actually having impact on the ground. All excellent questions from our three uh, members of the audience. So, yeah. uh, Axel, I, remember, I recall two questions were directed to you. Yes, and I will, I will try to answer those two questions. The first question, who, vi uh, who determines who violates? A very good question, and if put some thought into that. Of course, it would have to be the General Assembly with the resolution. And once the General Assembly, who of course would do that after listening to all sides, listening to all arguments, and then this would have a quasi-legal procedural type of... Um, uh, proceeding where you would, you know, you would listen to the arguments for, against, you would have uh, the victim standing up, you would have the potential alleged violator having the possibility to defend themselves, and then it is the whole auditorium, the whole General Assembly that determines that it is, it, they're going to trigger, the, the consequences will be triggered. And it could also decide that they will be waived, like they do decide to waive on, on some of the on, uh, 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 issues of, of when the legal dues are, are, are in, in arrears. So I think it could be possible. Similarly also to the question, uh, and you're perfectly right, I mean, I mentioned a lot of uh, um, possibilities that could happen, lots of potential consequences. Some the UN already would have now. The losing a right to vote, that is something that the Secretariat would immediately implement because it, it can decide that itself, is take away the seat uh, or take away the voting right, you would be excluded from voting. Um, Others already in the UN family, excluding uh, from um, uh, aid benefits, etc. Possibly that might also be. The other examples I've mentioned, uh, you know, you can you can think of many others where also international organizations uh, have a role in deciding whether states can participate in international cooperation. I agree. All of that would have to be arranged. It would have to be negotiated. It would have to be part of the system. But again, if we all agree that we want to make international law more normative, again, then, well, then let's prove that by empowering these uh, other organizations, these other institutions, then to help the UN uh, in this respect. 
Mr. Muller. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I think the observation is correct that uh, during the first term of a Secretary General, there are basically proposals discussed for structural adjustments. I would even go further, I would, would argue that in the second term, it's policy discussions, like we have seen now with the sustainable development and uh, now with the, our common agenda, which is also always in the second term. I don't know why that is, but I think it seems to be uh, uh, the case. Your question on what kind of structural adjustment uh, you would like to see, I want to be very specific. In, in fact, I believe that the current crisis of the UN does provide a serious incentive to introduce fundamental change. And our common agenda is a good framework for bringing this along. One of the proposals I like most is the transformation of the Trusteeship Council to tackle emerging challenges and provide governance of global commons. I also believe that there is a chance that this will be approved because replacing an obsolete governing body should be more attractive than just adding a new body. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, there was one question related to how we can uh, improve the coherence and the consistency of the galaxy of the UN system. That this big endeavor, and of course, nobody uh, is powerful enough to do that. But it, there was something, since we are thinking uh, outside the box and throwing out ideas that uh, sometimes, someday, maybe will fly, uh, the, it is an idea that occurred to me during the pandemic. So being closed in a house uh, so without you you think a lot and one of the 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 idea was why don't we this is a disaster the pandemic why one do we don't bring together all the agencies that are specialized one way or another in human security so i thought why don't we create uh, there is a, a un security council why we don't create a human security council, bringing together the uh, World Health Organization, FAO, uh, the, um, the welfare um, uh, institution, human rights uh, agencies together to discuss about how can we improve and make the difference in the world in terms of human security, which is complementary to hard security that is that with in UN Security Council. This can be uh, an improvement, but uh, you know, in the United Nations system, if you create another body, this means more bureaucracy and so on. But w there are ways, in my opinion, of uh, creating some sort of coordination that does not imply creating a new uh, uh, bureaucracy or institution. It's, it's the merit of uh, dealing in a consistent way with human security as a topic of all the United Nations as such. Indeed, Mr. Ambassador. In fact, I think that is the heart of the goal of the SDGs, which is to look at the human person as their education, their culture, their, their human physical security, but as well as their ability to express themselves um, to enjoy a planet that is habitable, to enjoy a, uh, a political system and an economic system that gives them a vested interest. So I, I, I don't think you're that outside of the box. I think it's yeah. very achievable, yeah. inshallah. Sure. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with regard to the effectiveness of the General Assembly that makes only recommendations, let's not forget, Uniting for Peace can do many things that the current 11th session has not yet done. It can ask for advisory opinions of the International Court of Justice. It can authorize military assistance. It can authorize uh, 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 use of force up to and including in the event of a breach of the peace, which includes aggression. So there are many powers within this Uniting for Peace mechanism that have yet to be used. There's been a condemnation. There's been a call for withdrawal. There's been a call for reparations. And there has been a demand that, uh, that international law be expect, expect, respected. But there's effective teeth. We keep looking for teeth. There are teeth in Uniting for Peace that haven't been, been triggered. Um, if we can um, keep in mind, our Ambassador Pascal has to leave in a few moments. So if there's any questions for him that we should prioritize before he leaves, um, and then we, we still have 15 more minutes for further dialogue with the audience. In that case, let me ask a question. And uh, maybe to all panelists, but beginning with Ambassador Pascal, as he's leaving us in a few minutes. Um, we want to keep in mind that there's a lot of work to be done, but there's also room for hope. 
What gives you hope for the UN's future? Well, I think that uh, one hope is the, are the youth. So no, um, this idea of, of creating, uh, uh, again, <laughs> a new uh, a body, a youth office, um, it's a good idea, this, in, my, in my opinion. It's not in the vein of uh, the United Nations models. You know, this is an exercise that are good for educational purposes, but to give the youth some um, role in, uh, in the ascending phase of the policies of the, the, the decided or discussing, at least in the uh, General Assembly or in the ECOSOC. So to have the, the voice of the youth organized and uh, uh, expressed in the best possible modalities and in the UN uh, uh, framework. I think this is important because uh, when we're talking about a topic of the United Nations, it's about climate change. It's about what we do about uh, uh, this, this planet, what we do about uh, the, uh, the, the cyber uh, uh, security, but in general, the digital dimension, the future, all things that uh, belongs to the young, uh, uh, belong to the to, to young people, and I think they must have a say, uh, not just in an informal hearing, because there are thousands of hearings, but institutionalizing in a serious way the voice of the youth in the UN system. Absolutely, yeah. they are the future, and it is their future at stake after all. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador Pascal. Thank we you wish very you much. a safe trip home. <laughs> Sorry, I <laughs> not at all perfectly understandable. Okay. We're grateful that you were able to yeah. be present with us today. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs>
unites us here in terms of our concern and our, our need to ensure that it remains not only relevant but effective. Um, so we have one more round of questions. Um, I see one hand here, if we can make sure that she has a microphone. And the gentleman in the middle. Thank you very much, Chiara Giorgetti from uh, Richmond Law School. Um, it, this has been a fascinating, uh, very, very interesting discussions, and I'm really glad that we touched upon so many interesting issues. Um, and I think there have been a lot of very interesting proposals, and I like some of the proposals that I've heard. I think there are other proposals for reform that kind of be, that, 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 that we could also think about, including, um, you know, obviously uh, uh, trying to make Article 248 more stringent, use of Article 27, um, you know, that you're not supposed to uh, deal with or participate in some of the discussions that um, um, that could pertain to the, the crisis that you are kind of part of. But my question is this, when I hear this, I have a lot of hopes. And then I put my international law hat and I say, okay, so how do we concretize this? And you talked about compliance and, and I think about reform. So what are the concrete steps that you can actually take to reform the charter? We mentioned that the amendment of the charter is very complicated and it requires the participation and the approval of the P5s. So in practice, how do you obtain the reform? How can you actually, uh, as, as using international legal instruments, how could you implement all these interesting reforms that I've been hearing? Thank you. I think could we go with Ambassador Marshak first this time, if he doesn't mind. Absolutely, though I will not be able to give you a satisfactory answer, I'm afraid, because yes, it's of course extremely difficult, just as it is in all systems where you have um, you know, embedded structures uh, over time, uh, and uh, it's very difficult to change, and you have also interests which are all over the place. Uh, but I think, again, uh, in a way, if we manage to get everyone together around the same understanding of problems and challenges, if we can agree at least what the issues are and the problems are, then sometimes it's possible to find common ground. And then whether it is through a charter <laughs> amendment, it's a bit of a complicated thing, or whether it's through a Liechtenstein uh, initiative type General Assembly resolution, which through a GA resolution uh, led to a considerable uh, you know, strengthening of the GA vis-a-vis -vis the Security Council because now the General Assembly more or less acts as a judge, or at least not as a, as a legal judge, but as a political judge about the use of a veto. So in a way you have changed something but nobody really made a big thing out of it, but it has an effect in the, in, the, in the work of the organization, and the effect will come in the future, of course, also. That's not a satisfactory answer, I realize, <laughs> but that's the way that the UN is, and things usually take a long, long time. Yes, very short. I think first I wanted to say that most reforms do not require charter revisions. I think this is... Uh, the case for, for, the, uh, for, for what we've seen during the last years. If they do require charter revision, things become pretty ugly or difficult. So basically, um, there is an understanding that those reforms are left on the side way because it requires a charter amendment. Until that is assured, I think there is no point really of proposing and uh, pushing for those. Thank you. take advantage of my, my, my position. Um, there is two concrete examples that should give us some inspiration. Peacekeeping is not mentioned in the Charter. When the Security Council confronted a similar situation as we face today with the UK and France, along with Israel having invaded Egypt, it was the General Assembly under Uniting for Peace that set up the first peacekeeping mission. So that should give us a model as to what is possible. The second, of course, is the Uniting for Peace, which is the legacy of the first use of, of, of uh, in, in the conflict in Korea, but has been used so many times to provide very concrete um, uh, mechanisms. Now, we, we say that it's recommendation, but it gives legal authority. And those member states that do want to act, rather than acting alone, as NATO did in Kosovo, for instance, where it was legitimate and reflective of the collective will, but it was not legally authorized, 
We can cure that by having a general assembly authorization. And nobody's obliged, but people are legally authorized to respond to aggression, to mass atrocity crimes, to all of these heinous violations of the most customary principles of what makes us a human family with common human values. There's a gentleman right here. Thank you very much. My name is Majid Mufaddal. I am the ambassador of Sudan. I have like a couple of questions. The first one is on the issue of enforcement. We have uh, now, I think the, the problem is more the, of not only the resolutions, but how to enforce them. We have uh, many resolutions by the Security Council on some conflicts, but have not implemented. At the same time, we have a host of resolutions by the United Nations General Assembly. We have referral to the ICJ, but it's a, I mean, on the ground, they don't have any, I mean, any impact on the ground. So how can we sort out this dichotomy of giving weight to this resolution, whether from that are not implemented, whether from the GA or from the Security Council? The second one is, don't you think that uh, with the rise in the global rise of the some countries in the global south, then you think that they can be, bring some sort of an opportunity of hope that we, there will be a new world, there will be a new approach that we can, how to tackle these global challenges. I mean, the fact that now the global south is in, I mean, in some sort of sense that we have now three world, don't you think that this is going to be a positive one that can give us hope that there will be something new thinking, new? And my third question is that regarding the issue of uh, principles in international law and national interest. I think this is the, the crux of the matter. You have international law, but when it comes between how to do, between to, to choose between in, to follow international law or, or national interest, most, in most cases, the country is going to use, to resort to choosing, giving priority to national interest rather than international law. How do you think that we can, I mean, try to convince the countries to make it the other way around? So whenever they, you have to, to choose, you have to choose international law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we have one final question from the online audience, um, uh, reminding us also that there's the angle of natural justice, and by that I believe the speaker, uh, Verender Anand, uh, who has put forth the question, reminding us of, it's not just about effective response, but it's also about holding those responsible for violations, including the permanent five, accountable for, for those violations. So I would uh, maybe give the floor to Professor mm -hmm. Mueller first, and maybe take this as an opportunity, since we have about five to seven minutes remaining, to uh, give your concluding remark as well. Yes, on the issue of enforcement of Security Council uh, resolutions, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not really competent to answer that, but I understand uh, legal obligation exists, but uh, implementation is not really forthcoming. So uh, where do we go from there? I really don't know. In, in, um, as, a, as a concluding remark, I would argue that uh, we should look in the, in the next couple of years or so to the central activities assigned, uh, attached to the common agenda, which provides us with about 90 proposals of reforms and require follow-up. So I think this would be the next step to go uh, by making this actually operational and, uh, and try to implement as much as we can. And we thank you. Thank you, Professor. Ambassador Marshak, you have the final word. That's a dangerous idea. But uh, I, 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 uh, let me try to answer the, the questions as, as good as, uh, as I can. I think on, on Ambassador, on, on enforcement uh, and, and, and that having no impact on the ground, yes, that's uh, very, very true. And I think uh, enforcement uh, is up to all the member states in a decentralized legal system as international law. It means it's up to all of us individually. And that of course, it's imperfect because some don't enforce uh, and some fail to enforce. And uh, that is why, <laughs> was one of the reasons why I proposed this uh, concept of automaticity, where it's no longer the individual member state that enforces, but it is international institutions uh, that adopt certain measures which are uh, 
a bit coercive and which might induce uh, potential violators to think twice before they, they actually violate. Uh, I have to again stress though that this is uh, this is my personal idea. This is not a proposal coming from Austria or anything. It's just some of the out of the box thinking that that, that we've been doing. Um, uh, I on the the question of the global south and the new approach. I think my my three worlds that I mentioned was just to indicate that everyone is living in different realities at the moment, and we somehow have to get together again. But I take fully your point that the Global South is, uh, I think, also maybe in a way due, due to the frustrations of after, uh, you know, lived through the pandemic and the and the you know the real frustrations that the Global South felt there. Um, the Global South is much stronger today, and I think it is bringing in its own positions more, uh, and it, they're much more. In the in 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 the picture, and they're coming with new ideas, and the global south is is revitalizing some of the debates that we've had in the UN for a long time. And I think there is some openness and some readiness in the context of this big our common agenda reform process to take up many of those ideas. And there are some very inspirational leaders from the global south who are coming with their ideas. And I think that's great and it's fantastic because it really enlivens our our, our discourse. On the third point, on the principle of international law and national interest, I think if we could convince all member states of the UN that it would be in their eminent national interest to make the system function properly by adhering to the principle of international law, that would be great. This will not always work, obviously, it's clear, but uh, I think uh, if we cannot convince them that it is in their interest to act with the law, we have to somehow strengthen the normative character of what happens if you don't adhere, if you follow your national interest. Think of it again, na personally, I will be tempted maybe to violate the norms and do something, but I can be either persuaded that it is not it is much more in my interest to follow what everyone else is doing and not violate. Or if I am very devious and terrible person, then I might be afraid of potential sanctions that might hit me. So I think if you have a good combination of inducing the states to act in accordance with the law and also to raising the the, 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 at least the possibility of consequences coming that are uncomfortable, if you manage that well, then maybe you have a package which persuades them to stay within the law. Thank you, Ambassador Marshak. I leave the final remarks to you, Mona. <laughs> a woman should always have the last word. <laughs> um, and let's end it on a hopeful note. I think the, the proposal you have can be aptly called Uniting for Justice, given that we have Uniting for Peace. Um, and what gives me hope is that I believe in the Charter, and it gives me great inspiration and, and confidence that the heads of state and heads of government unanimously agree with me that the roadmap to a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world relies on our recommitment to the UN values and UN principles. They said so in their declaration, and let's hope they live up to that promise again. Thank you very much for your time, and have a wonderful afternoon.